Welcome, and thank you for watching or listening to the ISSR 2023 Boy Lecture on Science and Religion discussion here on the ISSR YouTube channel. My name is Anthony Nairn, Executive Assistant of ISSR. The first live discussion occurred in 2021 after the late Tom McLeish's Boy Lecture had to be put online due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It attracted a large audience, and Tom's lecture and discussion helped cement the lecture and this post-lecture discussion as an annual online feature of the Boyle Lectures and ISSR's commitment to offering the public stimulating discussions on academic topics at the intersection of science and religion. What you are about to watch, or listening to, was recorded live after the YouTube premiere of the Boyle Lecture on 23 March 2023 with the Boyle Lecture itself recorded on 13 February 2023 at St. Mary Le Beau Church in London. The lecturer of 2023, who is also the respondent of Tom's 2021 lecture, was Lord Williams, or Rowan Williams, on attending to attention. In this discussion are Professor Fraser Watts, Dr. Harris Wiseman, Reverend Dr. Joanna Calicut, Lord Williams, and Reverend Professor Michael Rice. There are even a few audience questions in it as well. The aim of these discussions is to go beyond the lecture and push the lecturer to reflect on and engage with thoughts on or related to the lecture by other scholars. If you haven't yet watched the ISSR 2023 Boy Lecture, I would recommend you start there and watch this after. You can click on the link on the screen now or find the link in the description box below. And if you're joining us via podcast, please use your podcast provider to search for the ISSR 2023 Boy Lecture, which will likely be two episodes prior to this one. Thank you again for joining us, and please enjoy the ISSR 2023 Boy Lecture on Science and Religion discussion. It's great to be here with you this evening. I'm Michael Rice, and I'm here as president of the International Society for Science and Religion, and I imagine many of you will have just watched the recording of Rowan Williams and John Teasdale actually giving this year's Boyle Lecture in St Mary's Le Beau. What we've got now is a panel discussion and we're going to have several panellists, the first of whom is going to be Joanna Colcott, and then there'll be a chance for Rowan if he wants to, to respond after each panellist, and then there's going to be a chunk of time for more general discussion from everybody at the end. Okay, I think in that case, we can go, Joanna, straight to you and your thoughts, if you're happy to share them with us for up to five minutes or so. I guess what I would start with is um, something that John Teasdale has already mentioned, which is the convergence between um, much of what you were saying and um, psychological accounts of attention and also perception. Um, so firstly, the idea that attention is not a monolithic quality, but it's manifested in multiple and complex ways. Secondly, that there is an element of construction in the process of perception, um, that the organism doesn't passively register the environment, but actively organizes it. Um, and the relationship between the organism and the environment being understood as in some sense um, reciprocal, though the sense in which it is reciprocal, I think may be um, different from a phenomenological and a psychological um, perspective, with psychology being a little bit more modest about any metaphysical claims it might want to make. And then something interesting you said in your lecture about um, describing or indeed explaining reality at a number of different levels with no level um, of explanation trumping any other level. And that reminded me um, of uh, something that B.F. Skinner was very passionate about, which was recognizing the independence of these different levels in terms of explanation and defining a kind of reductionist explanation as, as using concepts from one level of explanation to try and explain um, phenomena at another level. Uh, and for him, it was particularly a kind of aversion to um, using uh, um, brain language to explain behavior. Um, which is an interesting kind of um, counterpoint to some of the work of Ian McGilchrist, which you also reference. Um, and then, I guess, because you finished your lecture with uh, saying that this was perhaps the beginning of what could be a, 
an interesting and, and a helpful conversation between um, psychological uh, uh, and uh, neuroscientific accounts and humanistic discourse. Um, I just uh, thought of some areas that it would be lovely to uh, pursue. Uh, one of those is the kind of more humanistic centered psychotherapeutic approaches, um, most famously developed by Carl Rogers, where attentive listening to the client is absolutely central to the, uh, the formation of the person, essentially. Um, you know, Carl Rogers' book on becoming a person is about active, attentive listening. I also thought there were some interesting potential links with neuroscientific accounts of religious experience or transcendent religious experience, which look at the, uh, or have identified the um, inhibition of the right parietal area of the brain as something that seems to instantiate feelings of um, transcendence of leaving the physical body behind the sensations of self uh, and the quieting of the ego that you uh, discussed. Um, I wondered about, uh, again, John T. Dell talked about the um, top-down and bottom-up type of processing and the relationship between them as we engage with the world uh, or conceptual and data-driven processing. I also wondered about uh, Jean Piaget's idea of accommodation uh, to the world and assimilation of the world, um, which need to be held in balance if one is going to adapt to the world. Um, something that people have invoked in descriptions of experiences of awe, um, where one is forced, in a sense, into accommodation mode, and that the ability to try and assimilate and impose stuff on reality um, is no longer possible. So those were some interesting points of connection I thought might be pursued. And in terms of questions, um, I guess one question I'm, I have that we might think about is, um, what about the attentiveness of God? Um, what what um, might human attentiveness and the sort of creative attentiveness that Simone Vale talks about, uh, what, what might that tell us about God's mindfulness of us? So those are some thoughts. Well, immaculate timing, Jonah. Thank you so much, Rowan. You're in the nice position. You can either choose to pass or you can choose to respond to that response or try and answer Jonah's question. Well, thank you. Um, just a very brief comment then, first on some of the things that Joanna raised. Um, particularly interested in the reference to Carl Rogers there, because that that notion of attention as itself person taught is something which, to my mind, belongs on that long spectrum of different analogical uses of the word attention and its creative effect. Um, so certainly something worth exploring there. And your Piaget reference, again, I, I warned you very much, very briefly on, on this question of the attentiveness of God. Um, in um, classical scholastic theology, there's this famous dictum, scientia dei causa rerum, the knowledge of God is the cause of things. Um, in other words, putting it into something like the terms we've been using, things are because God thinks them. They are because they are the, the objects drawn from nothing by divine creativity. And in that sense, when we engage within the finite world in this re reciprocal formative process, we are in, in some sense aligning with the creative act of God. Now that's you know, it's very much a, a theological statement but it is interesting that there is again a, a continuum here between different kinds of discourse about how attention works, what knowledge is, um, the creative, involving, participatory model that we're, we're looking at. So just an immediate thought there. Thank you. Thank you. Fraser, am I right in saying you're going to be the person who now responds next? Yes, thank you very much. It's a privilege to have the chance to do this. There's a way of approaching the dialogue between science and religion that focuses on content, on dialogue between two sets of assumptions. But there's another approach that focuses on different ways of understanding. And one of the things I very much like about Rowan Williams' work is his focus on how we know things. And I'd like to see more of that in discussions of science and religion. 
And if we do that scientifically, it will give a kind of primacy um, to psychology and the cognitive sciences, because that's where ways of understanding are studied scientifically. Theology has made a lot of use of philosophy and epistemology, but I think it could make more use of cognitive psychology alongside philosophy, as Rowan Williams has begun to do here. Rowan contrasts two ways of thinking about attention, one in which attention is a matter of selecting from things that are already formed, and another in which attending is part of the process by which they're formed. And he favors the latter. And as John Teasdale and Jarena have also said, research strongly supports the creative involvement of people in sensory experience. There's more I could say about that, but I won't now. And there are two modes of human cognition. One mode of cognition that works with things that are already formed with a fixed set of representations of reality. And there's another that's much more interactive and participatory, choosing on the hoof from many different possible ways of mapping the contours of perceptual experience. And I think humans can and do attend in both of these ways. And this comes out clearly in the cognitive architecture, interacting cognitive subsystems to which John Teasdale referred. There's a conceptual way of knowing that works not with direct sensory experience at all, but with representations of experience that have already been abstracted. And there's another more intuitive embodied way of knowing that connects directly with sensory experience and is more creative and can construe things in different ways. And you find both of these in both science and religion. Scientists can use their intuition to reach an initial insight about how things are in the world. But scientific theory likes to work with crystallizations of experience was a set of assumptions about what there is in the world. And religion also crosses the cognitive divide here. Contemplative spiritual practices often explicitly involve withdrawing from assumptions about the world. And that's part of what's meant by unknowing. Contemplative experience tries to be open to surprises and reconfigurations, though just as scientific intuitions can be crystallized in scientific theories, so contemplative experience can be crystallized in fixed doctrinal formulations. Science tends to value precise theoretical formulations, but religion values the experiential mode of cognition that learns to sit lightly on preconceptions so that people can discover the transcendent afresh in the present moment. Thank you. Well, again, Fraser, thank you for, for being succinct. Rowan, do you want to respond in any way? A um, couple of brief comments once again. Thank you very much indeed, Fraser. Um, that, that last point about working with crystallization of experience. Yes, I think that that is one of the things that happens in religious and scientific practice, that there are um, convenient crystallizations which contribute to the process of communicating, passing on the practices, the fundamental practices. You learn them certainly in practice, you also learn them by having the conceptual pegs on which to hang them in some ways, which make a convenient shorthand. The risk comes in, I guess, forgetting that that's what you're doing, forgetting that the crystallization is a process with a history. Um, it doesn't, it, it's not entirely innocent, it doesn't drop from heaven. And so there's, there's work, there's history involved in it. And if you forget that history by which crystallizations come into existence, by which scientific conventions arise and fall, by which doctrines are constructed, you um, I think you end up with the danger of an extremely crude model of the relation between subject and object in the world, 
and um, an inflexibility and ultimately a, a fundamental category error about what, what your knowledge involves. So that's something I, again, I, I resonate with very much. And the, the whole notion of working with representation is something I'm very interested in. When I, some years ago, read that book called The Edge of Words, I remember wrestling a little bit with what people were saying about this theme of representation and its different senses, um, which very often when people first learn about the sciences, they don't quite take on board as if there were a perfectly innocent, perfectly straightforward labeling, labeling system really made. And to beat a drum, which I beat boringly often in recent years, I do worry about the kinds of scientific education that a lot of our younger people absorb, where they don't grasp some of these points about the complexity of representation. And if complexity, then the you know the interest and exhilaration of sort of understanding that rather better has a way into the, the more direct and more constructive elements that you were talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Harris, over to you, up to five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Rowan Williams for the wonderful lecture and thanks for ISSR for having me here. First, uh, two points I'd like to highlight. The first point is to draw some dots between this Boyle lecture and the Gifford lectures Rowan Williams gave about a decade ago. I think this Boyle lecture can be viewed as a very natural successor to those lectures, which were primarily about language and metaphysics, whereas this is the tension in metaphysics. Um, there, Williams' uh, Gifford lectures offered rich reflections on how the manner in which we use language can tell us a great deal about the nature of God's creation, about God's creative work, and just so tonight with attention. Uh, one could say in Williams' framework that language and attention are inextricable, though not the same thing. One of the ways we pay attention to the world is through our language. How we talk about the world shapes the way in which we are able to attend to it and opens up new questions. And equally, language is itself something that we should constantly pay attention to, as Williams does. Uh, language is generative in itself, as is that attention. And our attention to language brings out more meaning from our words, new senses, and new things for us to pay attention to. So on that score, uh, point one, um, I would invite Rowan Williams to join some more of the dots, if he would, between his views on attention and language and how they interface. Uh, the second point is to highlight again something at the heart of uh, Williams' uh, metaphysics, which is a notion of participation. As we saw today, the world is not just there ready-made for us to receive, nor is it a pure freedom for us to make it any way that suits us. The work of attention is one of negotiating both the constraints of reality while still having an immense creative freedom because the field in which we are playing is much more like a flux with unimaginable potential than any neat granular box filled with fixed items ready made as if just waiting for us to stumble upon and pull them out of the box. Likewise, uh, Rowan Williams uh, dispels the corollary illusion that attention is just a simple beam of light that we cast around this box of fixed items, hoping to discover something. Instead, uh, Rowan Williams settles on a metaphysics that uh, accepts both constraints as well as an extraordinary potential. Both are there, the limitations of reality, which keep us grounded, as well as its extreme generosity in offering a seemingly unlimited field of play, things to attend to, meanings and objects to co-create. It's the extreme generosity of the potential within that field that allows us to keep finding new things to be attentive to, and new ways of representing the world when our old ways of speaking show themselves to be inadequate. So on that basis, the second point, I would invite, invite uh, Rowan Williams to say a little more on the connection between granularity and flux with respect to his metaphysics of God's generosity and uh, what our work in that order might be. Thank you. Well, thank you, Harris, very much indeed. And Rowan, a couple of quite tough invitations <laughs> there. I don't know if you want to try and respond to either or both of them now. Uh, thank you very much, Harris. Uh, 
th those are wonderful questions. You're, you're quite right, of course. This lecture is, in a sense, a, a long footnote to the Giffords, and it's it's one of a number of ways in which I've been trying to tease out some of the themes that were there in the Gifford lectures and making a bit more of them, especially I mentioned representation of the ministry. And you rightly um, challenged me or pushed me on this question of the connection of language and attention. And if I were just thinking, thinking out loud about that for a moment, it might go something like this. All, all that we've <clears throat> so far is about language, sorry, about attention as a form of engagement. It's not simply a standing back kind of description. To attend is to, um, to be involved to the, to the degree that you, you are asking in what way does this situation, this object, whatever, this set of stimuli, enter into a, an ongoing human practice on my part. And part of that ongoing human practice is, of course, language. And a realistic, and I use that term advisedly, a realistic use of language is one precisely in which our continuing human practice opens up rather than closes down the depth or the challenge of the, the stimuli that we're absorbing at any particular point. So there is, if you like, an attentive use of language and an inattentive use of language. What we were just talking about, both phrasing a moment ago, in terms of um, representation, slurotic forms of representation or slurotic attitudes to representative practice close things down. They're inattentive ways of responding to the world, precisely because they say, well, now we know what we need to know, and so how we talk about it is fixed and final. And that's why, if I were transferring rather rapidly to the world of the humanities, that's why the language of the poetic imagination is important for any epistemology because it's it's the kind of language that keeps things open. <clears throat> the best kinds of scientific language do exactly the same thing. On granularity and flux, um, goodness, uh, I wrestle with this because I'm I'm not sure I can be either granular or fluid enough to to do justice to what we're talking about here. But I guess that what I'm what I'm concerned about here is to walk the tightrope between, again, between two extremes. You, you mentioned the, the challenge of going between extremes on this. And for me, the, the tightrope is, is strong between, on the one hand, the, the crude ontology, which simply says, well, there's lots of lumps of stuff around. Um, sometimes they cluster together, and we just need to find convenient ways of tying them up together and doing them in bundles. That's it. And on the other hand, um, kind of lazy-minded use of the, the pantavre, everything in flux, where you, know, you can't you can't sort of seize on anything. And for me, what interests me is the fact that there are like steady and sustainable points of convergence in the exchanges of energy that constitute the universe. And those points of convergence are something like what we might refer to as substances, although they, they can be talked about, they can be real subjects of gravitation. And yet they are there because they're there in virtue of their being points of intersection, not little lumps. And to try and get that in focus in a way which doesn't simply dissolve any notion of finite substance, I don't think that helps us without falling into the error. Of imagining finite substances are a billion dollars. That's the challenge. Um, and I suppose that I, I haven't got a, a neat summary of that, but that's the sort of thing I, I keep thinking about in this connection. Thank you. Very rich response. Friends, colleagues, we've, we've only got just over about 10 minutes or so. So now's the time if you'd like to either make a comment or ask a question to raise a hand, either literally or using the reactions button on Zoom. And depending on how many people do so, we'll either take them one by one or might take two and three together. So we'll start, Bernard, with you, and then it'll be John Dobson. Um, thank you. I would like to ask about the relationship between 
attention and intention because the, there clearly is a, a, a relationship. I mean, I think you talked about attention as being a narrowing of resources in the perception and sort of cognitive processes. But in some sense, intention is rather similar. You're, you're narrowing your options to decide what to do. And so do you see the issue of intention as being closely related to the, the question of attention? which obviously also has many, uh, well, theological implications in terms of free will and things like that. I, sorry, I guess the question is, is addressed to, to Rowan Williams himself. Oh, that's but, okay, that's clear cut. Rowan, do respond if you'd like oh, to. Thank you, um, really interesting question. And again, not one that I've um, spent enough time on yet. So I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to give a bit of thought to it. I think that as with so much in this area, we, we're dealing with um, a spectrum of behaviours rather than just mutually isolated reality. So the attention and intention, as you said, belong together in some sense. I would, on the whole, I would see intention as designating something that is even more focused than attention, particularly because the way we use it, it tends to have immediate behavioral consequences tied up in it. We talk about intention as something that, if you like, gives us a policy relating to what we're attending to. But that policy of um, relating is something that wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't be possible or sustainable if we didn't begin in the, the rather, rather looser kind of attention, the suspending of various kinds of assumption that allows us to receive what's there and adjust ourselves to what's there receptively rather than um, proactively or dominatively. So maybe we should think about that kind of continuum and think of intention as different primarily because of its behavioral goal or its behavioral outcome. Mm. Good. We're, we're yes. getting quite a, quite a few questions, hands up now, Bernard, so I'm afraid I'm going to push on. Thank you very much indeed. John next, and then Tim, and then Jonathan. So John Dobson first. Oh, you may still be muted, possibly. John Dobson, you may be muted. John Dobson, I'm hoping you can hear me, otherwise we'll come back to you, but I think you're muted on Zoom. Uh, right. I think too much attention was paid in this um, very interesting uh, presentation, particularly from Rowan, about what you might call the hegemony of linguistic expression. I pay, I do a lot of attention, and when I get into a certain state, I hear music. <laughs> uh, when I look at pictures, I hear music. Sometimes when it doesn't happen so much now because I'm getting too old for it. But when, when I used to uh, read mathematical proofs and even construct mathematical proofs, my mind was full of pictures or pictures of patterns, not representational pictures. My mind was full of patterns. And I think this, this uh, whole idea of attending to attention isn't strictly linguistic in the way that Rowan presented it. It's based on some form of abstract pattern recognition. And we know, for example, uh, that babies respond to patterns in the wombs. Babies learn language uh, by pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, people, certainly me, when I was learning to play the piano, I was uh, concentrating on the patterns. And I would like to see a little bit more in this uh, disc when this discussion gets written up about not the linguistic aspects of what is going on but the pattern recognition aspects of what is going on well i i can only applaud that and, and accept the implied rebuke and say that yes i would want very much to broaden that out in exactly that direction because fundamentally when we're talking about language of course we're talking about pattern recognition and in poetry too, of course, po poetry is pattern recognition. You yes. know that. Yes, and I think I, I go back there to um, some things that Wittgenstein says from time to time about how um, 
when you're talking about language, you're not simply talking about simple verbal extent. You're talking about gesture. You're talking about yes, uh, physical posture and physical response. You you might be talking indeed, as you say, about musical um, resonance in a quite literal sense. You might be talking about a whole range of things that have to do with pattern recognition. So I, I'd be very sympathetic to pursuing it in that direction. Great. I'll take Tim and Jonathan together, which may be slightly unfair, but let's see if it works. So Tim, first of all. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, Reverend Dr. Williams, your your wonderful lecture had a, I'll just say about the, the give and take between what you might crudely call self and other, without wanting to draw those distinctions too simplistically, in, in the process of attention. And uh, I wondered if, if the model of attention that, that you're discussing here, what implications that would have for the attention involved in, uh, in self-examination, in, uh, in introspection, where, where those, those two, you know, the thing being, the thing contemplating and the thing being contemplated are, you know, the relationship is, is even more uh, fraught, you, you might say, you know, is, uh, is, is a taunt in veil sense even possible when you're, you're contemplating your own reactions, your own actions in the world? Um, does does a, a a contemplation of your own actions lead to a to a sense of uh, of connection with with the divine potentially? You know, you could maybe draw a connection with with Kant's idea of the moral law within as as one of the things leading you to God. Tim, thank you, and Jonathan. <clears throat> thank you to Reverend Williams and Professors Teasdale's and um, Watts for such a, a very expansive and illuminating thoughts. But my question is, um, what role do you think that hierarchy, and this could be hierarchy of being, of value, um, what role does hierarchy play in the formation of an ought with regard to attention? And maybe even more so vis-a-vis -vis Professor Carr's points about intention. Rowan. Well, thank you. Um, two wonderful questions. I'm sorry, in a way, we haven't got uh, another two hours or so to talk them through. Let's start the hierarchy then first. Um, it seems to me that when we talk about hierarchy, we're talking about, um, if you like, expanding, mm, expanding scope of organization. What accounts and what is there give us, allow us to get more in, make more connections. And in that sense, I think um, fully attentive response to our world is, although maybe incorrect, nonetheless one which potentially allows more to enter in. And instead of just being selective, in fact, it can be uh, rather more comprehensive in that we, we haven't yet decided what's worth attending to. And in a strange way, that rather more comprehensive response to the world is, is the way to, to go forward, that it will generate more um, subsistence as we as we go through, but again, fascinating. Which I wish I had more time to think about. But that's an immediate response. And then um, to Tim's question about um, attention to oneself, which is a really fascinating. So, um, yes, the the paradox is, of course, that attending to oneself is something which we can only learn in the processes of language and relation. We don't, we, you know, we don't just sit there as pre-linguistic beings looking to ourselves and seeing something. We, in our memory, we code and revisit encounters. We remember what is, in very crude terms, remember what is said to us. And so imagine who, who that is addressed to. We think that through. We give that something of the, in the proper sense, detached focus that we need to be truthful. We try to look at ourselves, something of the same um, dispassionate fairness that we, we need to give to others. And I think that's why, to again, to skip the categories a bit, in the spiritual tradition, self-examination is something you actually do in the context of talking to somebody else whether it's in confession or spiritual direction, um, and especially in the Eastern Christian spiritual tradition, what's called the exposure of thoughts. 
a lane there, your processes to experience elder is it's part of, of attentive self-examination. And it's what distinguishes a proper self-awareness and again on this kind of spiritual self-awareness from simple self-absorption that is going around and around the in, what I call the inner hamster wheel of you know re reworking our resentments, reworking our our dead ends and our puzzles and, and our fantasies. Um, and a really attentive relation to our own story requires a context, requires a relational context. Really fascinating question. Again, I'd love to spend more time on it. We're just at eight o'clock, so I'm going to do one or two thank yous. Um, the main one, obviously, goes to Rowan Williams. In the old days, one simply gave an invited lecture and then one had done one's bit. Nowadays, in this hybrid world, one generously comes back and does more, so that's hugely appreciated. Many thanks to the three discussants. A lot of effort goes into four or five minutes of response, so Joanna, Fraser and Harris. Fraser, along with Anthony, they get an additional thank you because an extraordinary large amount of work, of course, happens behind the scenes for these sort of events. So great to see everybody and see you either at future ISSR events or somewhere else. Keep well, everybody. Bye for now. Thank you, everyone.